Happy Thursday, Grace. Great to be with you this evening. My name is Jake. I'm one of the pastors here, and you just saw that if you were paying attention, but a Sing is happening on August 13th, Sunday, August 13th, 7 p.m. It's a chance for us as a church to come together and worship God through song uh, for a whole night. And so I encourage you to come back here at 7 o'clock, and here's what I know um, on that day that uh, we've done this for years, and uh, I don't know that I've ever met somebody who went to one of those and didn't leave refreshed, didn't leave encouraged, didn't leave going, man, I'm glad I made time for that. So August 13th, 7 p.m. in this building. Mark your calendars. Make sure you're back uh, to be a part of that. But glad you're here tonight at services and um, wanted to make you aware of something. I'm not sure anybody uh, coming in today noticed we're doing a small project out in the parking lot. Um, anybody notice that on the way? Yeah, so uh, a lot's happening out there, and um, we're excited about it, but some of you are probably like, why is there a massive hole in the ground? I started coming to this church like four weeks ago. Is it falling apart? Like, what is going on? And so, uh, in short, uh, if you were here for a while uh, at Grace, you know about not coming down, this idea that God's calling us to more as a church, to more disciples, to try to make a bigger impact in our community. And so, um, we've decided, man, God led us towards this addition to our building that's going to include things that are going to help build our church help serve our community in cool ways, your neighbors, people around you, your coworkers, as well as to help reach the generation, the next generation. And so there's going to be things like a gymnasium, a cafe, um, a, a playland, and uh, some ministry space that's going to be really helpful for us to continue to grow student ministry, young adult ministry, and a lot of other things. So I could go on and on about what that's going to be, but I want to tell you something that you're going to hear a bunch um, over the next couple years if you ask questions about that, is to go to the website. Go to the website. And so even right now, uh, you can go to the Engage page page and find your way to not coming down. Um, and that web page is, is the why. Like, why are we doing this as a church? What led us to this place? If you're curious, go there and find out. The what? Um, what's it actually all about? What's, what's going to be there and what's that going to look like and how does that serve those different ways? Again, go to the website. And then how? How can you get involved? How can you get engaged? How can you be a part of making that happen? All of those things can be answered on the website. And so I encourage you to go to the Engage page, find your way there. You can also, on the way out, you might have seen on the way in, uh, once you hit the double doors, there's a big kind of not coming down display. There's a card there with QR code. We'll get you to the website as well. Now, um, I don't want to give a lot of detail about it. I'd love for you to go to the website and see it. We're excited. There's awesome stuff we feel like God is calling us to. But a couple things I want to call out from the beginning. Uh, this is going to be a while that we're going to be in a construction zone. So if some of you are like, it's going to be done by like Christmas, it is not, all right? Um, so uh, get used to this as kind of the new normal. We're saying sometime in 2025, uh, if you're like, that's a whole 12-month window. That's how construction works. You never know on a lot of different things. So it's going to be a while before this is completed. And so we're going to be patient and excited for what God's going to do along the way. Uh, we've already gotten this question of like, where are we going to park? Like, it seems like our whole parking lot is gone. Here's the deal. You might remember this if you've been around. About this time last year, uh, we added on to our parking lot on that side of the building. And um, there's parking spots also, if you didn't know, on this side of the construction fence. And we're actually net positive in terms of our parking through this. So with what we added on last year and what we're taking away with that, we actually have as many and in some cases a few more parking spots than we did this time last year. So uh, just know that, that like uh, the parking lot's going to be full, but we prepared for it. We planned. We added on over there to make sure we had space for it. And then also, uh, we're excited about launching Lithopolis here in a few weeks. We're going to be sending out about 300 people to that as well. And so uh, I said I'd get back to like how you can engage this. Here's what's true. I know this is a lot of information. Um, some of you have already pledged and already given to be a part of this. And if you've done that, you're going to hear from us here in the next couple months just about kind of where you're at and you're pledging or you're giving and some more information about how you continue to, can continue to engage that. Some of you might be going, I love this church. I believe in what God's doing here, and I don't know about that, but I'm just excited, and man, it seems like people around me are excited, and I want to get involved. We'd encourage you to pledge. We'd encourage you to give, and again, go to the website, and you can see info on how to do that, but we need even more people to step up to say, I'm going to own this project, and so again, all roads lead to the website. For more information, I encourage you to go there to hear more about that. Now, um, we've been encouraging you in, in, encouraging you in this season uh, to be generous through Christmas in July, and we've told you about some specific needs in our community and said, hey, we'd love to, as a church, rally around these organizations as they serve people. And I'm excited to tell you uh, that we're 90% to our goals, we're not even to the end of July, of serving our community through Christmas in July. And so thank you for being generous. And, and just uh, to remind you, if you don't know this, but uh, through your giving, here's a couple things that have happened. 
Women who are coming out of prison who, who wouldn't have a place to live or to kind of recoup and, and, and recommit to society in a lot of ways have a place to live through Rachel's house and through lower lights that you've given to financially. Uh, some people in Canal that, that don't have the means in this season are getting school supplies and food and different things like that to help them in this season as the school season approaches. And so because of your generosity, here's what's just true. Our community is a better place. And so thank you for your giving. Thank you for being a part of that. And this is the last week to give. And so if you haven't done that yet and you want to be a part of Christmas in July, go to the website, go to the Engage page. You can see how to do that. All right. I know that's a lot of information, but here's, here's what I hope is true as we talk about Christmas in July, impacting the community, not coming down. I hope you're thankful. I hope you're thankful that, um, man, God's doing something at this church. That God's using this church to bless people, to reach people, that more disciples are being made here, that we're serving real needs in the community. I hope that grows a sense of thanksgiving in us. We talked about this last week, but it's where we want to start in our service tonight. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand, and uh, you're going to see a psalm behind me on the screen. So if you stand now, just read that for a moment, and then let's just sing to God with the spirit of gratitude, a spirit of thanksgiving for who he is and what he's done. person on the planet, if they're honest and they really look inside and look around, no matter how desperate their situation is, has reason to have thankfulness and gratitude. 
But the Christian, the follower of Jesus has a unique thing that drives our gratitude. At the center of our faith, at the center of our hearts is the essence of the gospel message that is culminated with the death, the burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The work of Jesus Christ coming and dying on our behalf. Jesus taking on flesh, coming to earth, dying in our place, dying a guilty man's death, although he was innocent for us in the place where we should have been dying instead of us. And in that moment, we are reminded of two incredible realities, that sin is worse than we will ever imagine it to be, but that God's love and grace is greater. And so one, there's this tool, this, this resource that God says, I want to remind you of that moment and it's communion. And so hopefully on your way in, you, you grab the bread and the cup. And I want you to go ahead and, and grab that and get that out. And, and, and I, I, wanna, I wanna be as gracious as I can about this in this moment. As I, as I said that the gospel message is at the center of the Christian's life and, and communion is something that is for Christ followers. I can't emphasize enough how grateful I am that you are here to be a part of uh, this service and connect to our church, hopefully. But if you're not a Christian, I just wanna, I just wanna ask that you just kind of take this in and listen and reflect and consider what is in your heart. But as a follower of Jesus, that you are reminded of two incredible realities. One, that Jesus, a real person, took a real beating, a real flogging, died a real death, and experienced real pain on your behalf. And so to remind us of that, we, we grab this symbol of bread, bread that Jesus broke the night before he was betrayed, that reminds us of his body that was given on our behalf. And so we eat and we remember. And communion also reminds us that no matter how far we wander, no matter what we have done, are doing, or will do is as it relates to our rebellion against God, our sin against God, our rejection of God, that the cross covered it, that because of the shedding of blood, our sins are forgiven and they are separated from the east to the west. And so that all of our sin is completely forgiven by the shed blood of Jesus and we drink and remember that blood that was given. When you feel the weight of this message, when you feel the weight of the gospel, if you're anything like me, you're, you're probably your natural response is, how do I thank God? And I think unfortunately for some of us, what we do is we try to become religious. We try to earn back the gift that was freely given, but, but the real heart of what God wants is a surrendered heart of worship. And worship manifests itself in a lot of ways, but one of the ways that it manifests itself is that from the depths of our soul, we cry out and we sing to this God who's been so gracious to us. Pray with me, God, in this moment, we feel, we remember, we sense the weight of what you have done for us. And what we want is our hearts postured before you to worship you with all of our lives. But in this very moment as followers of you, we wanna worship you with song because we can't do anything else but tell you thank you. So help us do it with our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your soul. Got a lion inside of those hips Get up and praise the Lord Come on my soul Oh don't you get shy on me Lift up your soul Cause you've got a
Hallelujah is just our sign of praise and our, our sign of worship to Him. And we want to have a heart tonight, a posture that we get to look back on, on everything that God has done and to say, God, we want to witness to the city around us, to the people around us. Let's continue to sing. When I was lost and all alone, your presence was where I found home. You say that I've witnessed it. Hey. 
God, thank you that you're faithful, that you're good. We want that to be true in our lives, that we recognize who you are and we can't keep that to ourselves. God, we don't, we don't have a choice but to praise you for everything that you've done. So give us a heart of gratitude to say thank you, no matter where we're at. Father, we thank you and we love you. Amen. Thanks so much for worshiping alongside of us. You can go ahead and have a seat. Yeah, I set three alarms on my phone. I don't know what happened. There's got to be something wrong. Fired. We're just gonna take the rest of the day off. Oh. There are bad days, and some of those bad days add up and they turn into bad seasons, and then before we know it, our bad seasons can turn into what feel like a pretty pretty messed up life. And uh, it's not always because of just you know, dumb luck or unfortunate circumstances, it can be because of the decisions that we're making. In fact, the word that could be associated sometimes with our lives is the word foolish. And so there's this sense where we've got to learn how to get it together. And God and his grace is kind enough to offer us wisdom to figure out how to get our lives together. And so starting next weekend, we're going to spend some time thinking about that. We're going to move from the book of Psalms right to its neighbor and end up in the book of Proverbs. And we're going to begin to think about this idea of how to get it together. And I think it comes uh, at a great time of the year for us as many of us are beginning to, uh, some feel fortunate about this, some feel unfortunate about this, move to the school year. And as we begin to think about getting our lives together and ordered up and navigating things, it's going to give us a good chance to think about how to put our lives together in a way that is wise. And so I hope that you're here. It's a great, great series to bring a friend or a guest with you as they consider how they probably long to have a life that is together and has wisdom. Well, it's really good to be with you this weekend, and I feel in some regard like I should introduce myself. My name is Keith, and I haven't been here for a few weekends. If you're not laughing, or you know why I'm saying that, it's because you haven't been here for a few weekends either. But I haven't been here for a few weekends, vacation and conferences and a variety of things. And before I go any further, I say this periodically, but uh, because I go to conferences and because I listen to sermons and because I pay attention uh, to what it is to be a preacher and a teacher, and then I sit in church on the weeks that I'm here when I'm not preaching, I want to tell you this, and you can think whatever you think about me, and, and I'm not talking about me, but for our entire church at every campus, you all are spoiled with great preaching. You're spoiled that every single weekend... Every single weekend, no matter who is up here, and again, take me off of it, whatever you think of me, but the rest of the group, they're incredible. You are so stinking blessed that every weekend at every campus, no matter who gets up, God uses them in a powerful and profound way to teach the truth of God, to be true to the word of God, to do it in an engaging and powerful way. And I don't know if you understand how incredible it is to be at a church that has that many people that are that good at it. It's incredible. And every week when I don't preach and I watch, I'm like, I can get hit by the bus now. Like I can get hit by the bus. People have been plotting or saying somehow I'm gonna have to go away at some point and I always die by a bus. It's always a bus. I guess I can go at this point because the team is just doing so well. But I just, I want you to know that and know how blessed that you are. We're, we're finishing up this series that we've been in in this summer, and we've been talking about the Psalms and we've been thinking about this idea of Selah and pause and ponder and and, and kind of in the middle of it, we've, we've really been processing what goes on in our lives 
that, that life goes on and life tra- you know, transpires around us and we've got to deal with things and we've got to process things. And we all, if we're honest, we want life for our life. And sometimes we don't feel like we have life in our life. And so we're trying to figure out how, how, to, how to get there. And we feel like the Psalms give us some really good resources and tools to think about. And so again, we've said it a lot of different ways, but I'm just going to say it to you this week, as we, uh, this week this way, that we've been getting tools for the inner struggle from the outer stimulus that we've been getting tools for the inner struggle that show up from the outer stimulus. Life happens to us. There's ups, there's downs, there's wins, there's losses, there's certainties, there's uncertainties. Uh, there's, there's just things that go on. And as we navigate those things, we say, man, how do I actually, amidst confusion, get clarity? How do, how do I navigate all that's going on to experience what God says for the Christian is the abundant life, the, the full life, the life that's meaning and powerful and, and really is rich. And so how do we get after it? And so we've been trying to say, hey, man, the Psalms helps us do this. The Psalm helps us figure out how to be happy. And not like in a shallow happy, but like in a real meaningful way. And so we've been working through these different types of Psalms. And, and I, I went through them. And, and really, if you've been paying attention, there's like a, a simple phrase you can associate with each of these. We started with the first Psalm of, of, of praise. And we said, you know what? We come out and our response to that is we praise the Lord. And then we went to a wisdom Psalm. And we said a wisdom Psalm should lead us to fear the Lord. Then we went to a lament psalm where life is tough. And we said, in those, we should trust the Lord. And then we did a remembrance psalm. And we said, we should remember the Lord. And we talked about a hymn song. And in that, we said, we should acknowledge the Lord. And then we did a royal psalm. And we talked about how we should call upon the Lord. And then we did a thanksgiving psalm. And we should thank the Lord. Now, come on, be honest. If you were a person who called upon the Lord, thanked the Lord, praised the Lord, sought the Lord, acknowledged the Lord, feared the Lord, trusted the Lord, and you did that daily, Tell me your life wouldn't have life. Tell me your life wouldn't have life. And if you're not a follower of God, like that's kind of gibberish to you. But for those of us that are followers of God, just imagine if we could even apply some of what we've been learning through the Psalms to really go, man, how do I take this outer stimulus, deal with my inner life in a way where I apply these Psalms and really lock into how God can manage my emotions, my life, all this stuff. Well, this week, as we end it, we, we go to the last type of psalm that we're going to deal with, which is, again, a really unique psalm. It's called an imprecatory psalm. And an imprecatory psalm is called an imprecatory psalm because in these psalms, there's an imprecation, which is really um, a call of misfortune upon someone else. It's where you call upon God to say, in so many words, get them. Get them. God, I, I need you to get them. And, and it's interesting because as we navigate these imprecatory psalms that show up in the Bible, there, there's this conflict in our soul. Like we see wrongdoing and we, we feel a certain way about that. But the Bible also says we're supposed to pray for our enemy. The Bible says we're supposed to love our neighbors ourself and, and really be pursuing goodness for people, even people that hurt us, that we should take care of people that hurt us. But at the same time, we're supposed to feel some kind of way about evil. So we'll try to put some pieces together of that, and then we'll land the plane on the series. Uh, Earlier this week on social media, I was just flipping through, and I saw a video that kind of caught my eye, and it it was a group of kids that were at some place that kind of looked like Magic Mountain at the miniature golf course at Magic Mountain, right? So they were at some kind of place like that, and there was some instructor that was clearly giving them instructions for a miniature golf tournament. And it was a group of kids everywhere from somewhere between Cammie and Cooper's age, eight or nine, all the way up to maybe 12 or 13. But in the middle of that group was what looked like a 24-year-old dude. And he's holding like a legit golf putter. Not a miniature golf putter, but like a putter that you take onto like a real golf course. And then as the video keeps playing, it shows him playing in this tournament against these kids. And he sinks this putt and a little headline comes up over it. He's now minus five, crushing the field. (laughs) He ends up finishing this little miniature golf tournament at minus three. And the next video, a part of the video clicks to, they're at like the ticket counter where you turn in the tickets to get the prizes. And the person who was leading the tournament is now giving the championship prizes to the people. And he's giving the prize, she's giving the prize to this man in front of these kids. And he grabs his gold medal and he, he bites it like in triumph over these kids that he's just won. And, and I thought to myself, I don't know whether to like go high five this guy or punch him. So I started to read the comments to see what I should feel. 
And what I saw in the comments was incredible. It was like 50-50. 50% of the people were like, this guy's a genius. He's awesome. We need to find this guy. I love that he took advantage of kids like Cooper. It's great. <laughs> and 50% of the people were like, where do we get this guy's address and harm him? Like, where do we go after him? And, and like people were writing like paragraphs of like, how dare this guy? How wrong is this guy? How awful is this guy? I can't believe it. If I ever see him and they're going off of me, it was, it was crazy. And, and as I thought about it, I'm like, man, I don't know how you feel about that guy, but I know this. If we were to talk, I bet you could find something in your life where you look at some situation with some person and you feel this way. If I could find them at their house, I'd like to do something. You want that person to get what you think they deserve. It, it, it might be some friend of your kids and he's just a jerk. She's just a jerk. She's a bully. She picks on everybody. You see it, you notice it, but they never seem to get caught. They never seem to get in trouble and you notice it all the time and something wells up in your soul. There's that person at work that doesn't do any work, but they keep getting promoted. They keep succeeding, they keep going forward. And you're like, dude, if I could and I wouldn't lose my job, we would have a problem. There's that family member that every time you see them, they stir up the pot, things go bad, Thanksgiving gets worse. Everything is like, I hope they don't come. I hope they're not there. And they're not just kind of mean, they're like awful and disrespectful and terrible. And you think about, man, I wish I, wish I could. I wish we could turn Thanksgiving into a fight. Then there's some of us that like we move it forward and we see like government people, like whether it's regimes in other places or even our own politicians at times where you see and you're like, man, they're wrong, they're awful. Like, what are we gonna do? You know, someone in business and they, they lie and they, they don't actually sell what they say they're selling on the label. And, and in all of it, something wells up inside of you. Something stirs inside of us. And, and here, here's what it is. We, we all come to a place where we want justice for wrongdoers. We want justice for wrongdoers. We want that 24 year old that was playing golf with those kids. We, we want somebody to, to get them. We want somebody to do something to the politician. We want something to happen to our coworker. We want, we want something to happen to that kid who harms the other kids. We just, we want something to happen. And, and really what's inside of us is, is what C.S. Lewis once referred to as the ought principle, the idea of ought, that things ought be a certain way, that you, you ought not be allowed to punch people in the face. You ought not be allowed to harm people. You ought not be allowed to pursue injustice over people, that, that we sort of intrinsically know that when wrong happens and there's injustice, we should seek justice. We should figure it out. We should say that that's wrong and we should do something about it. And we all kind of sense this and want to get after it. But then some of us as Christians were like, am I really allowed to feel that way? Am I allowed to feel that way about Sarah at work? Am I allowed to feel that way about my uncle? Am I allowed to feel that way about about that person and who's a part of that government who does, am I allowed to feel that way? Because again, I'm supposed to pray for my enemy. I'm supposed to love people. And so we feel this tension. And, and yet I wanna, I wanna for a second call out something that's even maybe a little distinct from the tension that needs to be said out loud. Because even if you're not a follower of Jesus, I bet you feel this. You want, you want justice for wrongdoers. You, you want wrong to stop. But I wanna submit something to you that I want you to think about for just a second, and it's this, that there is no right and wrong without some type of standard. There is no such thing as right and wrong without some type of standard. How do you actually decide that that young man playing golf against those kids is wrong? What's your standard? How do you decide that your coworker is wrong? What's your standard? How do you decide that your that kid to the other kids is wrong? How do you decide that, that your uncle's wrong? How do you decide that that government's wrong? Where does that come from? Where do you get your idea of right and wrong? I've shared with you guys before that when I do marriage counseling, particularly with non-Christians, I ask them the question, do you believe in a such thing as right and wrong? I've never had a couple tell me they don't. And then my, my next question to them every single time is where does it come from? 
What is your standard? What is it based on? Because we have a lot of people who say things are wrong, but when then you ask them, what is that based on? They don't have anything to stand on. And I would look at you just in love and in kindness. If you want to be like an intelligent person and an honest person and intellectually real, you have to be able to answer the question, what is your standard for right and wrong? What do you base it on? I know that we live in a world that says your truth, my truth, any truth, don't push on truth. Truth can be truth. I don't even like the word truth. Don't say the word truth. It's true not to say truth, all that stuff. But the reality is you said it's wrong. Based on what? Based on what? Where does the idea that every human being has human dignity even come from? Where where do we get the idea that we get to say that that's right and that's wrong? Where do we get to push on these notions? And so before I go any further, I would just love for you to ponder in your own mind, particularly if you're not a follower of Jesus. Where do you get your standard of right and wrong? When you say, I want justice for wrongdoers, what are you basing that on? And can it really hold up? Now, to say it obvious for those of us that are followers of Jesus, those of us that are Christians, it it brings us full circle to where we actually started the series. Because we're reminded that our standard is is built on a a simple reality, and it's the reality of God. In fact, we we would say it this way, that the inspired word and the incarnate king are the standards for right and wrong. How do Christians decide what is right and wrong? We go to the word of God. We go to the truth of God. We go to the scriptures. We go to the person of God, who he himself is truth. We go to the one who's never failed. We go to the perfect holy one. And we say, if we want to know what truth is, we want to know what right and wrong is, we want to know what justice is, we want to know what injustice is, we go to the inspired word and we go to the incarnate king. And doggone it, we shouldn't go to our emotions. We shouldn't go to politics. We shouldn't go to what's popular. We shouldn't go to some other book. We should go to God. And we should say, what is right and what is wrong according to him? How do I get to say that that person deserves justice because they are a wrongdoer? Well, are they wrong in the eyes of God? Have they sinned against God? Have they trespassed against his law, his direction? And fundamentally, all of us as followers of Jesus have to come back to a place where we go, our standard, our truth is not philosophy or something that's made up. It is the person of God and his word. And actually that's where happiness is found. I, I could spend so much time developing this, but man, you, you just don't even understand how much the word of God and the Christian faith has shaped Western civilization. Human rights, women's rights, the rights of people, the rights of children, the rights of the unborn, people pursuing hospitals and orphanages, people thinking about stepping in and saying, I want to foster kids. Like all of that is rooted from the ethics and heart of God and his word. As we look at what is right and what is wrong. Now, the reason that this matters in particular connection to this psalm is because the psalmists are going to say, God, get them. And is the psalmist allowed to say that? Well, I think we're gonna see through the heart of this particular psalm what we should have as a heart for those of us that are followers of God. If you've got a Bible, turn to, turn on Psalm chapter five. Psalm chapter five. And many of these psalms that we've been working through are from King David. And this one is from King David, written again to the director of music. That may be a real person, or it may actually just be kind of a title that they've given to God. And it says in Psalm 5 in the heading that it's, it's actually written for the pipes or for the flutes, depending on your translation. And this Psalm of David is connected when, when a really tragic thing was going on in his life. David had a really rebellious son named Absalom. You can read about this in 2 Samuel chapter 15. And Absalom wins a following and he attempts a murderous coup on his own father. His own son gets a following to come and help him and he pursues going and killing his own father, David. David in his distress wrote a bunch of things, cried out to God in a bunch of ways. And Psalm 5 is another example of David navigating this in his life, this outer stimulus. What does his inner life Feel And here's what it says in Psalm chapter five, verse one. Listen to my words. 
He's begging, petitioning to God. We've seen this a lot in the Psalms. Lord, consider my lament. Again, there's really two categories of Psalms, lament and praise. And we said, but those can be broken down. So this is a lament and specifically in the category of imprecatory. And he says, hear my cry for help. Again, just different words, but like, God, I need you. I need, I need you to hear what's going on. I wanna call out to you, my King and my God, for to you I pray. And we've seen this over and over in the Psalms that when we have this outer stimuli happen in our life, the first thing that should happen in our inner life is we should run to God. We should cry out to God. We should petition God. So David does that and then it continues and it says, in the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and wait expectantly. It's easy to focus on the idea that he says, I'm praying to you, I'm making my request to you, I want you to hear me and I'm gonna wait with expectation. But I want you to notice when he makes this call. Two times, in the morning, in the morning, it says. Now, for some of you, you're like, dude, I can't do this. I'm not a morning person. If it said in the evening, in the evening, dope, I'm in. But I'm not a morning person. But but I I, I wanna say this, and, and this is just, come on, for all of us, for all of us. There's something profound and powerful when we start our day with an invitation for God to be a part of it. And I'm not saying you gotta get up at 5 a.m. for that. I'm not saying you gotta, you know, sit and have this long time with God before. But what I am saying is, could we all learn that in the morning, something that would be really good for us is to invite God into our space, to invite God into our pain, to invite God into our situation, to look and say, God, today's gonna be a day, whatever it's gonna be, and it's gonna be however it's gonna be. And I invite you to be God over it. Or that you take that situation to him. And again, man, like, I just want to say this because I'm I'm preaching to me on this. Like, we will get up early for things. The other day, I got up with the alarm at 4.45 to go golf at 6 a.m. And I didn't think twice. But somehow, if someone says, meet me for coffee at 6 a.m. to talk about the Bible, it's like, well, game the night before, late, don't. But he says, in the morning... And then he begins to talk about what's going on in his heart. For you are not a God. Listen to this. This is, this is intense. For you are not a God who is pleased with wickedness. David just calls it out. He says, like, when I look at the world, I'm, I know you, God, and I know how you feel about things. You are not a God that is pleased with wickedness. I know that God is love. I know that. The Bible says that. God is also a lot of other things. And in our definition of love, we have put justice and truth on the sideline. And one of the things that is true about the God of scripture, the God that we follow, Yahweh, the Christian God who sent his son, Jesus, who is himself God and and dwells us with his spirit is that he hates wickedness. He hates it. He can't have it. He doesn't want anything to do with it. And he says, I know you and you're not a God who's pleased with wickedness. He continues to build this out with you. Evil people are not welcome. Pause. Everyone's like, wait a minute, Keith, I've heard you say we're all evil. We are. But what he's saying is people who are evil, who have no desire to repent and seek God and know God and follow God and get right with God. Those people are not welcome in the space of God. I know that the, that the world teaches you that everyone is God's kid. Everyone is not God's kid. Everyone is made in the image of God. Everyone is invited to be in relationship with God. Everyone can know God, but people who reject God and pursue evil and don't want God are not connected to God. And he says, you don't welcome those people. They're not in your space. He continues to build this out. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. Well, we know this, that grace for the humble, the person who's contrite and broken, but the arrogant person, they don't get to be with you, God. You hate, you hate all who do wrong. People who don't care about doing right, people who are evil, people who rebel, people who are not interested in you, God. You destroy those who tell lies. The bloodthirsty and the deceitful, Lord, you detest. Some of you are like, oh man, this is the Old Testament angry God. 
Good thing Jesus shows up. You know what Jesus says? If you've seen me, you've seen my dad. Me and my father are one. The Lord is the same today, yesterday, and forever. David looks at what's going on in his life and he goes, I know how you feel about wrong. I know how you feel about evil. It's not good. And then David pivots in verse seven, but I, me, David, for me, your great love can come into your house. Most people think he's talking about the tabernacle. In reverence, I bow down. My posture changes to you towards your holy temple. Lead me, Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. Do we all see the contrast that David's like, you do not like those people. Don't make me like that, man. Work on my heart. Change me. Help me walk straight forward. Help me be holy. Help me be about you. Help me be prostrate in my posture and in my life before you. And then he continues, not a word, moving back to these people, not a word of their mouth can be trusted. Their heart is filled with malice. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues, they tell lies. Now you might describe the situation different, but for some of you, this is how you feel about Johnny, 24-year-old golfer, golfing with the nine-year-olds. Or this is how you feel about your uncle. Or this is how you feel about your coworker. Or this is how you feel about somebody in the government. Or this is how you feel. And you look and you're like, they are awful. And you might even be right. They may be awful. And you're like, what am I supposed to say? What am I supposed to do? Well, here, here's what David says. Hey, God, this is the imprecatory part. Declare them guilty. Oh, God. Let their intrigues or their counsels or their plans or their ideas be their downfall. This is harsh. Banish them for their many sins, for they have rebelled against you. Some of you are like, this is great. I didn't know I was allowed to do that. <laughs> now listen to me. The only way, look, this is huge. The only way that you're allowed to do this is twofold. One, that you're trusting God to deal with them, not you. And that your aim, listen to me, is redemptive, not retributive. That your aim is that as God would discipline them, shape them, punish them, Make them feel what they would feel. What would happen is that they would see God, turn from their ways and follow God. That you would say, they are wrong, they are evil, but I play, pray that they would see God, they would repent and they would meet the Jesus that I've met. But he's also giving you freedom, look at me, to feel the way you should feel about evil. To feel the way you should feel about awful. To feel the way that you should feel about terrible things. We somehow have told Christians that you're not allowed to be heated up about things that are evil. No, you are. But in the middle of that, you don't try to fix them. You don't try to solve it. You say, God, they're yours. God, I pray that you deal with them. I pray that you handle them. I pray that you take care of them. And then David pivots back and he goes to his own heart again. But let all who take refuge in you, God, be glad. Let them, those who know you ever sing for joy, spread your protect, protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice in you. Surely, Lord, you bless the righteous and surround them with your favor as a shield. He contrasts again the evil the rebellious versus those who are in connection with God. What we see in this Psalm is the heart of David. And what we really see is what the Christian heart should be. And it gives us the opportunity to understand where the imprecatory Psalms fit while at the same time, while we should pray for redemption and for our enemies. And here's how you should function if you are a Christian. You should love right and you should hate wrong. You should love what is right and you should hate what is wrong. You should look and go, God is right. His truth is right. His mission is right. His ways are right. His fruit is right. 
His word is right. So I love what is right. The devil is wrong. Evil is wrong. Sin is wrong. Deception is wrong. Death is wrong. So I hate what is wrong. And again, the psalm is giving you permission to be upset, to be worked up, but to in your soul love what is good and hate what is wrong. Can I just be real practical for a second when I think about an example of this? Um, it's gonna be pretty personal for some of you because maybe your, your kids are in this stage. Um, some of us, we raise our kids and then by God's grace, we say we're gonna send them off to college and we have different reasons that we decide that we wanna do that. And so we send them off to college. And while they go off to college, they spend years upon years just getting hammered, smoking weed, partying their faces off. And I'm in no way saying that we can fix our kids' hearts. I'm in no way saying that we can control our kids. I'm in no way saying that we can parent them into obedience. I'm not saying any of that. But what I am saying is that when you find out that your kid is rebelling against a holy God in outright sin, your attitude should not be dismissive. Why? Because you hate what is wrong. You hate what is wrong. And on the same side, when you see some other young person who is honoring God and seeking to honor God with their life and their holiness and their dating and the way that they're handling substances and partying, all of that, you shouldn't be dismissive and minimize that. You should say, praise God for that young person. Why? Because you should love what is right and hate what is wrong. I didn't say you should love one more and love one less. I didn't say you should love one person and hate one person. I didn't say you should be nice to one person and mean to the other person. But what I did say is what you see that is wrong, you should hate it. And what you see that is right, you should love it. When our culture starts calling things that are awful good, we should hate it. We should hate it. It doesn't mean we have to be obnoxious. It doesn't mean we have to be rude. It doesn't mean we have to be divisive. But we should look at it in our soul. We should go, that is wrong. And when we see things that are right, we should champion. We should lift them up. Why? Because the Christian loves right and hates what is wrong. And David looks and he goes, man, God, I know you. You are no fan of evil. You are no fan of injustice. You are no fan of people who plan terrible things. You are not good with that. So what I wanna do is I wanna be right before you. Why? Because the Christian loves right and hates wrong. You know, as we think about living this out, I just wanna give us two thoughts from the Psalm to consider this weekend. Uh, thought number one that I want us to think about if we're gonna love right and hate what is wrong, I wanna begin with this phrase, which is water your own lawn. I love where David starts in this Psalm in verses seven and eight. But I, by your great love, can come into your house. In reverence, I bow down. Lead me in your righteousness. Make your path straight before me, David says the first heart that I need to deal with around this issue is not the people who are getting it wrong, but my own. You ever notice how good you and I are at um, judging ourselves by our intentions, but everybody else by their behaviors? Because what we're really good at, and I've said this for years, is we're really good with binoculars, we're really bad with mirrors. We're really good at looking at everybody else. But David says, if I'm gonna love right and I'm gonna hate wrong, I've gotta make sure I water my own lawn and take care of my life and my heart and my posture with God. You, you guys know I've been telling you that really a passion in the last several years has become the game of golf. And I try to play it as much as I can, as much as my marriage will sustain, you know, I'm allowed. Um, but I play most Fridays with a guy that I work with here at Grace. And um, he's, he's a little better than me. He just is. And um, he's offered me strokes in our competitive games and I'm too proud to take them. I don't want them. In fact, the last time he offered me strokes, I literally told him this. If you try to give me strokes one more time, I will punch you in the face. Do not offer it again. 
And so we play and we're competitive and we have a little bit of fun with it every single week when we play. And, and sometimes when we're playing, what I can end up doing is I can end up asking myself or paying attention to, okay, it's a par three. Did he hit a good approach? Is his putt gonna be tough? Did he hit a bad drive? Is he in good shape? Is he in bad shape? And sometimes I spend, so, listen to me, sometimes I spend so much time paying attention to his own game, I don't pay attention to the fact that I'm just bogeying my way through the course. Because I am so mindful of how he hit his seven iron, I didn't pay attention to how I'm about to hit my own. We are so worried about the world's understanding of sexuality and the churches as a giant mess. We are so concerned about the world and their sense of materialism and we are just as greedy. We are so concerned about the world's pursuits that are shallow and don't matter in the scope of eternity and we lose our minds and invest in the same exact things as people who don't know Jesus. We are so concerned that they're lying to us and then we're afraid to be bold for truth at the office. If we want to love right and we want to hate wrong, the people that it begins with are Christians in their own hearts, in their own personal circles, beginning to say to God, God, it starts with me. Come on, straight up, I love you. How much do you love right? How much do you hate wrong? How much does your time with God, your commitment to scripture, your commitment to serving, the way you're generous, the way you tell people about Jesus, how much does it reflect that reality that you love good and hate what is wrong? I'm trying to guilt us. I'm not trying to shame us. I'm just simply trying to put the mirror up to us and say, we need to be like David and say, start with me. Make my past righteous. God, make my heart postured before you. God, make me more in love with you. God, stir my appetites for you above every other appetite. You know, sometimes it's, um, it's challenging to be able to have the full power of God upon us and upon the ministry of our church, even in terms of something like a testimony, when people meet me and they find out where I pastor and then they look and they say, oh, I know that person in your church and they kind of turn away. And when I say what, and when you dig a little bit, what you find out is that the person who's a part of this place is not really loving good and hating what is wrong. Now get it, listen to me. We're all on a journey. We're all welcome. We're all figuring it out. But if we're gonna claim the name of Jesus, we've gotta be committed to the things of Jesus. And we've got to hate what is wrong and love what is right. And it begins with us watering our own lawn. I, I've said it before that when somebody else's yard starts looking a little greener than yours, it means you need to turn the water on your own. Take care of yourself. Number two, number two, David drives this principle home. Let God be God. Let God be God. Remember in verses four through six, he, he lays out, man, God, you're no fan of evil. You're no fan of wickedness. You're no fan of awful stuff. Those things can't be in your presence. And then in verse 10, declare them guilty, O God. Let their intrigues be their downfall. Banish them. He says, God, they're yours. Go get them. You do what you need to do. God, you go pursue justice and you make it happen. Whenever you interview for a job, whenever you get a job, one of the first things that you get in that interview or when you get the job is you get a job description and the job description tells you what you are supposed to do and what you are not supposed to do. And sometimes in that job, you start to do stuff and your boss comes up to you and your boss says, that's not your job, that's somebody else's job. Let them do that, you do your thing. Sometimes they'll say, you're not doing your job. This is in your job description. You should do this. Sometimes they say, you know, you're, you're, you're messing it up because you're getting in the way of somebody else doing what they are supposed to do. Here's what it says in James chapter four, verse 12. There is only one lawgiver and judge. You know what is not in your job description or my job description? Lawgiver and judge. There is one, it is God. 
We can get frustrated about evil. We can get mad about evil. We can see what is awful. But when we look to say what should happen to those people, we should say, God, you are judge. You are the one who knows and you should go after it. There is no room for vengeance in the heart of a Christian. It's not our job. It's not our job. It is the cliched saying, hate the sin, love the sinner. Hate the evil, love the person. It is not our job to run around and be the guilty police. It's not our job. We can say to God, I'm so sick of my uncle. I don't like it. He is a jerk. He is awful. But God, I trust you to deal with him. And then be done with it. Why? Because it's God's job to be God. You know, sometimes when we have these conversations, we're like, yeah, but... But somebody's got to get them. Somebody's got to get them. Somebody's got to get them. Read the Bible. God gets them. He gets them. And it's, listen to me. Come on. Instead of praying for God to get them, pray that they'd repent. Pray that they'd see it. Pray that they'd meet God. Pray that they'd have an encounter. Do you know that there was a time in your life where someone was praying, God, get them on you. We've got to let God be God, love what is good, hate what is wrong, want the redemptive purposes in mind and believe that God will do what he needs to do as he sees fit. Now, in all of this conversation about right and wrong, I think it's impossible, at least for me, not to like begin to think about how God deals with right and wrong ultimately, which is really to go to the cross. In fact, I, I said it this way, that, that considerations about right and wrong should lead us to consider the cross. And, and why should it do that? Because, because the cross reminds us that God is deeply concerned about holiness, deeply concerned about right, deeply concerned about wrong, that he does call things sin, that he does call things out of bounds, and he cares about them so much that he died for them. That God is so interested in justice that he paid the price, that he took the wrath of his own father upon him for everything that's ever been done. God takes sin so seriously that he died for it. And by the way, if you live in a world where you run around and what you say is I hope people get what they deserve, then you don't understand the gospel because the gospel is all about you not getting what you deserve. It's all about God giving you something none of us deserve. It's about God saying, I've seen everything you've done. I know everything you've thought. I know everything you wanna pursue. I know who you really are in the quietness of your soul and mind. And I died for you anyways, and you're still my kid when you receive me. And God loves what is good so much and hates what is wrong so much that he who knew no sin became sin and experience the wrath of God upon him so that you and I could become the righteousness of God. The cross reminds us that God takes this very, very seriously and he takes justice very, very seriously and that things that deserve to be punished are indeed punished. What I wanna do for a minute is just try to put a bow on all of Psalms <laughs> this summer. And as we've been talking about all of this and praising the Lord and trusting the Lord and remembering the Lord and thanking the Lord and calling upon the Lord and all of it, it's all built on asking the question, how do you really feel about God personally? So I wanna ask all of us a very honest question. It's really kind of what we just wanna do for a minute, which is what is the status of your relationship to God? Like you personally? What is your personal status and a relationship to God? For some of you, you may say, I have no relationship at all. And I would invite you to know that God wants to start one with you. And you are invited to do that. And you can do that by just saying to God, God, I want relationship with you. I receive what you've done through the person of Christ. And I want to be in and I want to be your kid. Maybe for some of you, your status is like, you know, the friends you went to high school with? You know of them and about them and you used to be connected, but it's been a long time. You're not praising him. You're not running to him. You're not, 
Maybe for some of you, you're angry. Maybe for some of you, you would say you're Christians, but I would ask you in this series, do you interact with God the way the psalmist does? Where you fear, where you trust, where you, or the moment life is hard, it's, man, I don't trust God. I, I run to wine, I run to work, I run to my kids, I run to working out. I know God's done some really great stuff, but I've kind of forgotten that and I'm just leaning in to my current life and I don't even remember what God's done in my past. Like, where, where are you? And so what this series has invited us to do is to say that there is a God, an omnipotent, all-powerful, real, holy, perfect God who, listen to me, cares about every aspect of your life and looks and says, my word and me as king are good enough and big enough to hold them. Bring me your life. Tell me how you feel. Tell me what you're dealing with. Trust me, remember me, believe upon me, call upon me. Give these things to me. Grace, the, the Bible through Psalms has been clear that God wants you to have life in your life. This church wants you to have life in your life. Me, Pastor Keith, wants you to have life in your life. And as I scour the earth and as I read and as I listen and I pay attention to podcasts and I hear people talk and I, and I listen to what goes on, I have found consistently that there is only one way to have more life in my life and have more life in your life and it is to continually draw near to Jesus. To just more and more Less of you, more of him. Less of you, more of him. More trust, more belief, more remembrance, more calling upon. And guys, we say it a lot. There's nothing else that can hold the weight of all you're dealing with. And for some of us, we're willing to put the weight of our death upon Jesus, but we're not willing to put the weight of our day to day upon Jesus. And Psalms is inviting us to say, all of me, for all of him, here it is. And the only one who can sustain it is the person of Christ. Would you pray with me? God, the human experience is, it's hard. It's beautiful and it's powerful, but it's hard and it's been messed up and compromised and complicated by sin. Our own sin, the sin of others. And as a result, we're just constantly looking for life in our life and we're constantly looking to be able to deal with the ups and the downs, the wins and the losses, the, the goods and the bads. And in all of it, Psalms has brought us back to go, Lean into truth, the truth of the word and the truth of the king. God, there's nowhere else to go but to you. To the only name that saves, to the only king that is, to the only one that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is God. The only answer is to draw near to Jesus. So you keep drawing and grace, let's keep responding. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, amen. Let's stand and respond together.
let all who take refuge in the Lord be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. I hope this summer as we've paused, pondered, and praised the Lord, uh, it's been a chance for you to be glad that your God is good, your God is great, your God is near, your God loves, your God sees, your God cares. And uh, just pray, and our prayer has been for you this summer that um, it has put some life in your life. Um, we don't know what you're going through all the time, but um, we just pray God has used this time. We trust God will continue to use uh, these moments, his word, and your relationship with him to fuel you, uh, to encourage you, and ultimately to build you up. A couple things before we wrap up here tonight. Uh, if you need prayer for anything at all, if this, uh, for whatever reason, has caused something in you that uh, you just want somebody to pray for you or with you, come to the left of stage. We'd love to do that with you and for you before you leave here today. And then if you are new, uh, stop by Grace Central on the way out. It's on the right-hand side before you go. Um, and we'd love to meet you and help you get connected more here, uh, learn more about ways you can get involved and, and hopefully get even more life in your life. And then remember next week, we're starting a conversation that as we kick up the fall in school would be great for you, great for friends. So invite somebody, be back here next week and we'll see you then. God bless. <laughs>